and welcome to our webinar on the arts, the relationship between the fine arts and practical real world skills and how this integration influences the elective track that we offer at Thales Academy. This webinar is being recorded and it will be released on our Thales Press YouTube page, as well as our Developing Classical Thinkers podcast. Q&A is also gonna follow and you can type your questions into the special Q&A box that should be one of the options on your Zoom window. I would ask that we avoid using the Zoom chat feature unless you're having some sort of technical issue. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Winston Brady and I'm joined here by Ashley Baer and Matthew Ogle, the senior administrator and the assistant administrator respectively here at our Thales Rollsville campus. As you can see, we're recording in different rooms around Rollsville, the LIT room and our art studio to showcase the different sides of the arts. That is the activities and the theoretical knowledge needed to participate in those activities to showcase how the arts help to educate the whole student. As far as an agenda, I'll be presenting an overview of the arts. Matt will present in the liberal arts tradition and Ashley will present on the industrial arts those practical real world skills, as well as some more practical information about the schedule for our electives next year at Thales Academy. So with all those housekeeping details having been taken care of, let's go ahead and get started. What are the arts and how do we rank them? Our English word art is a translation from the Greek word techne, which means art or technique or skill. And philosophers beginning with Aristotle distinguish between arts that are focused on thinking and arts that are focused on doing or making something. And a lot of times there's a threefold division between the arts, not exhaustive, and many philosophers will divide the arts up into different ways, but we can begin with the liberal arts, which are the arts that free an individual from ignorance and help that individual learn how to think. As far as examples, these would be the subject areas in the trivium, such as grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and music. Then there's the fine arts, the arts that inspire the soul and bring joy to life, which would include painting, singing, and woodworking. Practical arts, which are those arts that produce a product really necessary for material well being and human flourishing. And as far as examples, that would include, say, metallurgy, sewing, and every teacher's favorite fake class, underwater basket weaving. This distinction is important because an education is supposed to prepare students, not just for college, not just for a job, but for the whole of life. And we can't possibly predict all of the challenges our students are gonna face in the years ahead. That's why the aim of a classical education is to educate the whole student to shape their moral and mental faculties for the better and to prepare them for the myriad challenges that await them out in the world. With this goal in mind, we are restructuring our electives track at Thales Academy to provide a deeper focus on the fine arts, studio art and chorus and drama, and those practical household arts so that students would not only have the ability to sing and read music, but also fix stuff around the house when the occasion arises. Our founder, Bob Luddy, frequently urges students and staff to change the world by changing yourself, starting with yourself and changing the way that you react in a given situation, perhaps. And we can add to this maxim that you can't change the world or change yourself if you can't change a light bulb. And this is where that integration of the fine arts and the practical arts come in. But again, how do we rank the arts? Aren't those practical arts, practical skills, like coding, for instance, unquestionably better? Well, let's go back to the Greek philosopher Aristotle for help on this question. For anyone who may not know, Aristotle was a student of Plato, as Plato was a student of Socrates, the founder of, say, Western philosophy. Aristotle started his own school called the Lyceum, and there he lectured widely to his students on topics ranging from logic and political theory and literary theory. And most influential amongst his works is a book called The Nicomachean Ethics, a work on ethics, the nature of the good life that orients the activities we do in life 
with the goal of life, human happiness. He begins his work in the Nicomachean Ethics with the observation, every art and every inquiry and similarly, every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be that at which all things aim. As Aristotle draws out the implications of this insight, he states that people ultimately do things to be happy and to achieve a state of human flourishing unique to human beings. This allows Aristotle to rank activities on a hierarchical scale with some activities uh, contributing to that state of human flourishing more so than others. Ultimately, we all want to be happy. And we pursue certain things believing that they're going to make us happy. But ultimately, it's happiness that we're seeking, that state of human flourishing. Two examples, we know many instances of people working jobs that they may not necessarily like, but they do it for the sake of the money that they earn, which can make them happy to an extent. There's a certain material threshold, material well-being that money can provide, providing for your family, providing for others. Those are all good things, but it's very different. That's very different than say, taking up painting as a hobby for the joy one receives simply in painting. One doesn't paint a picture for any sort of, one might not paint a picture for any sort of material reward, but they participate in painting and sculpture for the joy that they receive in creating something beautiful, which is part of the reason why art is always amongst the most popular elective choices. Aristotle concludes that arts that people do as an end in themselves because of the joy that they receive in participating in that activity are better and more worthwhile than the arts that people do as a means to something else. One example that Aristotle gives is that of contemplation, meditation, and philosophy. That in focusing all of our mental faculties on ideas that are true, good, and beautiful, we can find real and lasting joy. And that's why we engage in the contours of a, of a liberal arts, great books, education, the kind of which we offer at Thales. Now with this distinction carefully drawn, let me turn it over to Matt Ogle, assistant administrator here at Thales Rollsville to talk about the different kinds of arts and how they fit in within this criteria. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Uh, I, in approaching this subject, have, I've thought a lot about uh, the fine arts, of course, uh, making a case for the arts. Um, I would actually propose, and I'm gonna begin with this, that, that I believe it's an axiomatic truth that the fine arts are absolutely to the proper education of, of every student. I say this because we could go into a lot of reasons uh, why we should study the fine arts um, in, in particular. Um, you know, they promote a sense of well-being and self-confidence. Uh, they uh, tend to cause an increase in, in community attachment and actually promote higher achievements amongst students. Um, there was a time when fine arts were cut from public education uh, budgets um, because people didn't uh, have the same value of them, perhaps, uh, that we're trying to express or traditionally. But that movement is over because uh, the, the outcry against cutting the arts has, has reawakened people to realize um, their central importance. So my apology is going to begin just with assuming that uh, we should all take the fine arts, but I want to root that and ground that in the tradition that, of our school. Uh, showing how the arts have always been integrated into um, the, the classical liberal arts tradition that, that we uh, at Thales use as the model for our uh, style of education. Um, as Mr. Brady mentioned, um, those liberal arts are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, those liberal arts have, have uh, always been the studies that help to set people free from ignorance. And um, in classical tradition, there were seven disciplines that, that amounted to the studies of, of the liberal arts. And we divide those into two groups. Uh, the first is called the trivium, and they were verbal arts to do with uh, words and information and logic. Uh, and 
uh, we still use those uh, phrases like grammar and logic and rhetoric in our school today uh, for the same reason that they were part of the original um, liberal arts tradition. The trivium helps every student develop the mental skills to acquire knowledge, to explain uh, why things are the way they are, and to communicate uh, well that information to others, to build arguments and to uh, communicate those arguments. And in the study of those three disciplines, there is a mastery of information uh, that, uh, that people can acquire uh, through that study. The other four uh, disciplines of the original liberal arts are called the quadrivium. And um, instead of arts of the mind, these are arts of matter. The quadrivium was the study of the physical universe around us with uh, what were considered the four fundamental properties of the universe. And traditionally, those would uh, be astronomy, geometry, music, and arithmetic, as you see here. Now, we may, in a modern sense, may disagree with, um, with that take on what are the fundamental properties of the universe worth studying. But I would like to point out, and, and the reason I, I stress this, is, is that music is found amongst one of those uh, fundamental properties. And representative of the arts, we see that music and arts has always been integrated and it serves an important function in education. And I'd like to um, illustrate that just by for a moment talking about um, how the, the quadrivium here uh, was approached and, and some takeaways that we should have that help to set up um, our modern take on the liberal arts tradition rooted in the philosophy of the quadrivium. Um, essentially, you can break that down further and group these four studies into two categories. The first were the study of a fundamental property of the universe known as number. And originally the, the art of arithmetic was, was to help you analyze as an individual, analyze the, the role of number. Um, individual numbers being a discrete and static property of the universe, we can count objects um, by their number. Interestingly, music was also a study of number. It was a study of arithmetic and motion. Um, uh, musical notes, for example, are mathematically separated frequencies from each other, and there is a, a ratio, a uh, fractional relationship between them. And those notes can play in harmony with one another. So rather than being discrete, music is the interaction of this fundamental property of number. And music involves movement, the dynamic motion of, of one number to another. And in, in that approach, then, this fine art of music becomes... A, a, a property of the real world around us um, that helps to inform and explain um, uh, the universe that we're in. The other, the other uh, subjects of the quadri quadrivium were geometry and astronomy, and they were the study of form, of shape. And this is maybe where we think the arts would be found, of course, in the study of form. And in our modern day fine arts, yes, we still study the form of the universe around us through the expression of the fine arts. Traditionally, geometry was the study of individual shapes of objects and uh, uh, categorizing those officially according to uh, their geometric forms. And astronomy was these same objects, but in motion. Um, traditionally, we would study the movement of the celestial spheres and the stars in the heavens and get an idea of how um, objects move in harmonic motion and are dynamic in their, in their motion across the, the universe. From this basic idea, I hope you can see that there is a place for the fine arts within this tradition. The music becomes an expression of the universe itself. And the sciences as a discussion of form, but, but the fine arts have a place in describing the form of the universe too. There was a rediscovery of this Aristotelian tradition of, of human happiness and human flourishing as one of the goals of of correct education. And medieval scholars uh, began to examine this sense of virtue. Uh, what is it that makes people virtuous? How do we codify these ideas, uh, uh, this Aristotelian goal and incorporate it into education? And that was done through the development of three ideas, uh, three or identification maybe is a better word, of three transcendental elements um, that are unique to human beings that, that drive the, the formation of the soul and the character towards human happiness. And those three transcendentals we know by common names of truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, the medieval scholars believed that when we focus 
as humans on the knowledge of what is true, the knowledge of what is beauty and beautiful and the knowledge of what is good, it in turn helps to shape and form our soul. And now we have a very powerful educational uh, tool at our disposal. We have acquired knowledge and we have achieved a sense of virtue and character. And when you combine um, rich and deep knowledge with a good sense of character, uh, uh, then the goal of education becomes wisdom, uh, to be able to correctly apply and ethically decide what to do with the knowledge that you have gained. So there is a, there is a pattern here that we begin to experience and benefit from when we focus on this. And the fine arts play a really vital role in this um, methodology, because in a sense, we can achieve a sense of truth uh, through the written word. We can achieve a sense of goodness through character interactions um, uh, with other people. But to really truly appreciate and, and apprehend and, and recognize what is beautiful, we need the fine arts as a description um, and a demonstration and a model of those transcendental elements. Really, art can describe anything true, beauty, beautiful, or good, but it's really in beauty that we find the, the virtue um, in art. And as such, these arts that we study begin to shape our soul in accordance with that virtue and move us in that direction of um, a human flourishing and human, human happiness um, that Aristotle spoke about so long ago. Therefore, in our modern sense of, of what incorporates uh, the, the, the fine arts here, uh, we don't just teach music, but we look at other expressions of beauty, poetry, painting, sculpture, architecture, the performing arts. These have all played a role at some point in um, education to help instill that sense of, of beauty. And it's done so that students are guided towards a deeper appreciation of these elements. They add richness to the studies uh, of the quadrivium and the, and the trivium. And uh, most importantly, the arts move the soul to apprehend and appreciate that which is beautiful. So in our modern school setting, how do we incorporate all of this information? We study all of these aspects of, of human endeavor through uh, a modern sense of the, of the liberal arts. And um, our curriculum here uh, includes the studies of um, the uh, human arts, um, also known as the humanities, where we study human history, uh, human sociology, human nature, and get to understand who we are as people better. Um, Mr. Brady, would you mind moving on to, to the next slide? Thank you. Um, we study the fine arts, the, the, which is this rich uh, experience of those transcendental elements that can sometimes be difficult to put into words, but form the soul. Um, and we study the mathematical and the scientific arts, where we really focus on the language and form of the natural world around us in that same liberal arts tradition. But here at Thales, of course, um, uh, wanting to uh, be as well-rounded as possible. Um, the other aspect that we're talking about today are these uh, practical arts and the, uh, that we are calling industrial arts in our new um, elective choices and our new, the new classes that, that we are developing. Believing that these also have a vital role because these industrial arts uh, will give the practical skills um, that every student needs um, to help uh, increase their material well-being in conjunction with their uh, philosophical, educational, and um, emotional uh, well-being. And for more information on that, I'm going to hand over uh, this webinar to, to Ms. Ashley Bayer. Um, we do have a new and restored focus um, in, into the industrial arts. Um, our, our school is planning to offer um, a series of courses um, from sixth to ninth grade where we are going to balance what students have learned um, within our, their fine arts um, curriculum and their core academics um, to really help modify the technical skills um, that they learn here um, in the modern fields. In fact, I truly believe that's what makes Thales Academy very unique. Um, we balance both a classical education um, with the, the skills needed to um, navigate through the modern world with real life technical skills. Um, as Mr. Brady um, mentioned earlier, you can you really be successful in life if you cannot change a light bulb. <laughs> so um, our goal is that every student has exposure to these practical engineering skills um, that's relevant to the age that they are at and the development of that particular student. 
going back to the 1120s, um, Hugh of St. Victor would label these as mechanical sciences. He discussed the importance of individuals learning fabric making, commerce, agricultural, med medicine, um, and he said that those were household practical skills that every person needed to know. So um, as we look at what would fall under the umbrella of those um, mechanical sciences, we decided to build um, coursework that um, exposes students to the idea um, during the school day of how to practice different skills um, that they can apply in real life scenarios um, and do that in a meaningful way. We know that over time, fundamental truths are, are reached through questioning. So by students being exposed um, through the classroom in a very safe environment um, in opportunities that they have to build hands-on problem-solving skills, um, we know that they will flourish. Um, so they will be exposed to basic tool use through carpentry and plumbing and engineering and electrical engineering. Um, and again, there will be an emphasis on safety and procedures um, and also an element that we know that they're going to fail um, and it's okay to fail and it's okay to ask yourself those questions, why did this problem not work? Or why did this circuit um, not light up? And that way they can continue to strengthen their reasoning and problem solving skills. As a school, we know that we are we are preparing students for jobs that do not exist yet. So um, it's so vital to equip students with the real life technical skills that they need to be successful in the 21st century. So within this new industrial arts program, um, every student will have exposure um, throughout their program to the practical engineering skills that are relevant to their age and to their developmental skills. Um, we will intertwine this with STEM um, activities, as well as just different life skills of cleaning up that work area, practicing those safety um, pieces each and every day. And we know that as students do that, they will continue to build their confidence in those areas. Um, we also know the importance of grit. Um, as students solve problems, they're going to make those mistakes and ask questions um, as a group and collaborate together to be able to reach the outcome um, so that they are forced to learn from their mistakes, but then continue to grow. Um, the next you know, important piece of that is that students are going to foster um, creativity and they are going to go through that design and engineering process um, so that, that when they are given a simple task, um, they can think outside of the box and um, begin to be creative and accomplish the goal that is, hand, is at hand. So overall, this course is gonna teach problem solving skills, critical thinking skills, creativity, curiosity, decision-making, um, which then again instills a sense of leadership, entrepreneurship, um, and also that acceptance of failure and more um, within them. So to get into some of the details um, of what this entire elective track will look like, um, along with our industrial arts coursework that will span from sixth grade to ninth grade, um, that will be integrated into our PE rotation at our 612 campuses. Um, so students will have the option to take a semester of PE, a quarter of health or technology, depending on the grade level, and then have exposure to that industrial arts course. Um, for our fine arts track, um, students through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade um, will be able to choose which track of fine arts they would like to um, embark on. So students would have the option as an incoming sixth grader to choose to take band um, throughout their three years, or as a sixth grader, they could participate in a rotation where they are exposed each quarter to one of the fine arts, which would be choir, studio art, theater arts, and music history. Once they have those foundational skills, students would be able to then progress um, into seventh and eighth grade and choose which fine arts electives they would like to take as a semester elective. So for example, as a seventh grader, I could take a semester of student studio art and then a semester of theater arts um, and be able to choose based on the foundation that I was given in sixth grade. 
as students progress into high school, they're given um, more courses um, to choose from. And then they're also given an additional track that would build off of the industrial arts skills that they learned previously. Um, so the three tracks would be a band track, a fine arts track, or an LIT track. And LIT is short for the, L the Luddy Institute of Technology. As a student in ninth grade coming in, um, I would be eligible to take advanced band. Um, I would need some prior experience with an instrument to be able to take that course, um, but students could continue to build off the skills that they learned within junior high um, to progress through their musical talent. Um, if I did not want to choose band, I could choose the fine arts rotation um, where I would be given a choice of two semester electives um, that are listed here um, and be able to progress through those classes. So for example, I could choose poetry or I could choose Shakespearean drama um, for my semester electives. If I did not want to choose the fine arts and wanted to build off the industrial arts, um, we would get, then I could choose to go through the LIT program, um, which is a phenomenal program where students get a um, foundation of um, engineering skills that they then progress over four years. Um, many of our students that have gone through the LIT program do graduate and move on to um, engineering programs at four-year universities. And um, each year is focused on a different skill set um, that students will build upon each and every year. So for example, um, LIT1 is really focusing in on the fundamentals. And as students progress through the program, they will end with a capstone project um, where they get to lead a project management um, exercise where they design, they create a budget, um, and they build a product by the end of the year that also um, coincides with their senior thesis project. That encompasses all of the changes um, to the curriculum in our fine arts elective. Um, and hopefully you can see the value in that program um, and in these enhancements after hearing about the importance of the fine arts um, in today's webinar. But for now, I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Brady to finish out our webinar. Well, thank you, Ashley and Matt. And whenever you're embarking on a new project the likes of which of redoing our electives track to have that renewed focus on the fine arts and the practical industrial arts, it's very good to start with the goal in mind. Because the truth is that we can't necessarily know what the challenges students are gonna face in life or what a student should act like what, once they get out of Thales. They could look like, those students could look like anyone because all students are different. They all have different gifts, talents, and aspirations. But we believe that a classical education is uniquely equipped to help students be their very best by showing them the very best, the very best works of literature, the very best works of art, works of human culture, those scientific proofs that showcase the beauty, the harmony and order in the natural world. Still, despite the fact that we don't know, we, we do want to consider that goal of what we want, hopefully what we want to produce and we're bringing about these changes. Our goal in educating students to their highest potential is similar to that of the Roman educator Quintilian. You see, our spiritual founder at Thales is obviously Thales of Miletus, one of the original seven sages of Greece, but a close second for spiritual founders may be Quintilian. He lived during Rome's great silver age, and he is perhaps the only teacher from the ancient world to have written some real concrete principles by which someone could actually run a classroom. And Quintilian had real world experience teaching. He tutored the second cousins of the Emperor Domitian, the same emperor who actually exiled the Apostle John to the island of Patmos, which makes me all the more uh, appreciative of the incredibly supportive community that we have here at Thales Academy. Quintilian only wrote a few books, but you only need to write one hit to be remembered through the ages. Quintilian wrote On the Education of an Orator, a massive 12 book volume on how to conduct the practice of education and to teach what Quintilian called the ideal orator. So to Quintilian, the ideal orator was someone who was as eloquent and proficient at public speaking as he or she was committed to truth telling and personal integrity. In the Institutes, Quintilian describes the ideal orator in the following way. We are to form then the perfect orator 
He cannot exist unless he's a good man. And we require in him, therefore, not only consummate ability in speaking, but every excellence of mind. Every excellence of mind certainly includes not just writing and speaking, but also the sciences, mathematics, light bulb changing, and personal integrity and grit, all character traits and skills that students need now more than ever. And that's why classical education is so valuable today. It helps students to love the things that are worth loving, their families, their neighbors, wonderful books, strong friendships, meaningful conversation. In short, everything that makes up the nature of the good life. A classical education cultivates students of excellence through the contemplation of what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. The kind of training for a life of happiness and virtue and joy that a classical education offers out to students. So with that, we can close our webinar and we can start q and A. I'm already seeing some uh, questions in our Q&A box, which should appear across your Zoom webinar. We're gonna take just a few moments to look through some of those questions there, but I did wanna open it up to Ashley and Matt to talk about perhaps your favorite painting, favorite work of art, favorite musical. Go ahead and answer quickly, favorite painting. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I would say my favorite musical is Wicked um, and my favorite painting would be um, anything within the regatta with Guy Manet. I love sailboats. <laughs> uh, I love Wicked. Uh, that's a good question. Favorite, favorite musical. Um, I, I might have to, to say that one as well. My, my favorite painting, this is an odd one. I'm not, a, I'm not devoted to, to um, modern art. And yet there is a Jackson Pollock mural that hangs in the, the National Gallery on the mall in Washington, DC, that when I stand in front of it, it moves me emotionally in a way that I just can't explain or can't quite put into words. Um, and I'm fascinated by that interaction that, I, that I've had with that painting a couple of times that I've seen it. So um, it's an odd one to choose, but, uh, but it sticks out in my memory. Um, so, Mr. Brady, I'm noticing that we have a lot of questions coming in just about schedule, so I'd like to, to conquer some of those. Um, so one of the questions that came in is, <clears throat> will students rotate by homeroom um, for, the, for the industrial arts course, um, much like we do with our PE health and technology rotation? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, so students would be grouped so that they're exposed to all of the classes over a year, and each quarter that group would rotate. Um, the same idea would apply for sixth grade fine arts. Um, students would be required to take all four of them unless they choose the band track. So they would travel um, in groups throughout the, the year by quarter to be exposed to all four of those classes. Um, so I hope that that answers that question. Um, we also had another one come in saying there are two junior high elective periods. Um, I noticed that that came in from a K-8 campus. Um, 612 campuses and K-8 campuses um, run a little bit differently schedule-wise. Um, and while we are all um, following the focus of integrating as many fine arts um, as possible, as well as um, an industrial arts course, um, the sequence of that is gonna look different at a 612 campus versus a K-8 campus, just based on the way that the schedule follows. Um, so Apex and Rollsville will follow that traditional quarter um, sequence that, that I was speaking about in the presentation. However, our Nightdale, our Raleigh, Holly Springs campuses, um, any others that are offering junior high programs um, may look a little different in what their offerings will be, just depending on enrollment and staffing. Um, but know that those changes will be reflected in the schedule for next year, um, and your administrator will have those details once it's time for course registration season next quarter. Um, it, of course, it looks like there's another question about um, do we get to choose which track um, elective we embark on? Yes. Um, as students, you can choose whether or not you're going to take the band track, the LIT track, or the fine arts track. Um, the, only, the only grade level where that choice is limited um, in terms of what courses you would take is sixth grade, um, but students still have the choice to take either their band track or their fine arts track. Um, I see one question about um, arguments that you, that you guys, uh, that we're trying to make. 
um, we're making the argument that the uh, a liberal arts education, a classical education is worth pursuing for its own sake because it helps you to think, but it also imparts a unique sort of joy to life. Um, as you study great works of art or you read great books, um, you know, those sorts of joys, those sorts of pleasures, they're, you know, they're practically free. You know, you can go to a library and check out a really good book and gain hours upon hours of entertainment reading it, going to a museum, as uh, Mr. Ogle mentioned, uh, and, and staring at a Jackson Pollock painting. I tend to take hours uh, walking inside of museums as well, trying to, to soak in as much of that information and knowledge as I can. You know, at the end of the day, um, as, as teachers and educators, we really love what we do, and we're trying to communicate that passion uh, to our students, right? Hoping that you guys will catch, you know, that love for great books, great teaching, uh, the same way that we do. Let's see. So we have one question from Jennifer Williams about the skills that are going to be taught in industrial arts, particularly in eighth grade. Mr. Ogle, do you want to take that? Uh, take that particular yeah. question. Yeah, I can. Uh, um, although the short answer is we are currently developing that program. Can you hear me? Okay, just making sure. Sorry, I had a strange message. Uh, the short answer is we are developing that program right now. So um, I can't give specific ideas, um, but we do think that we will uh, be teaching students some important skills that are appropriate for their grade level that give them some practical um, hands-on ability to, to solve some problems, say, around the household. Um, we will be publishing more information on what the, that, that means. Um, if I were to preemptively promise something that um, that changes, I would I would feel bad, and so I don't want to I don't want to give specifics at this point. Um, uh, but if we think of it as a sort of uh, the very best of a STEM class combined with the very uh, best of like um, uh, introduction to engineering class, uh, with the idea that some of our students will be inspired to move on to the LIT program in high school, and every student will acquire some skills that will be useful for uh, to them um, moving forward. So I hope that answers the question for now. And Mr. Ogle, a follow-up question. What about taking the same elective both semesters? I'll let you and Mrs. Bayer handle that one. I will handle um, Mrs. Bayer. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that depends. Um, it will depend on grade level in campus and availability of staff. Um, so we are still um, in those planning phases of working through all of those logistics. Um, a lot of that, you know, our our goal is that students are exposed um, to those fine arts programs. So in the event um, a student tries to take an elective both semesters um, and we're able to offer that, there would be priority given to a student that has not had the opportunity to take that course. Um, so I will say we will have to table that that detail as well um, until course registration season. Um, just in the just as we're working through enrollment and schedules and staffing um, to be able to what to finalize what courses would be able to be offered. And Matt, is there anything that you want to add to that? Uh, no, that was a good answer. A question just came in saying, "Is art history um, being considered?" And um, uh, one answer to that is that we are uh, working to uh, make a stronger connection between our uh, studio art program and the history that the students will be studying in the same grade level. And so um, there, will be, there will be a stronger curricular connection between the two. So over time, um, a student does get an exposure to art history, um, but we feel that our focus is going to be on reinforcing the sort of cultural elements of the history program uh, with some art projects that are related to or inspired by the, the art that typifies the, the um, period of time that they're studying. So some examples of that, in seventh grade history at Thales, we cover uh, European history. It's a focus on Europe, but from the fall of the Roman Empire to the fall of the Soviet Union. So there would be, say, like a special unit on Renaissance art in which students would be studying some of the finer details of, say, like Raphael's School of Athens, uh, Michelangelo's La Pieta, the Sistine Chapel, trying to look at how some elements of art uh, showcase some of the cultural trends, as Mr. Ogle said, uh, going on during that particular time period in history, the renewed emphasis in the Greco-Roman classics, in and alongside, um, you know, 
uh, the teachings of the church and the Bible, seeing how that brings out in the artworks of the period, you know, even on something as beautiful as the Sistine Chapel, where you have um, prophets on the one hand and then figures from uh, Greco-Roman antiquity on the other. Absolutely beautiful works of art. And that fits in so well with what we're trying to do. As part of a classical school, we want to inspire our students to be their very best. And so we're going to show them the very best works of art as a means of aspiring them to reach, you know, for similar uh, lofty feats. And that looks like the last question. You can kind of hang around a little bit and see if any more, um, any more come up. Um, if any questions come up um, after the close of this webinar, please feel free to email me uh, at winston.brady at thalesacademy.org. You can also email Ashley Bear at ashley.bear at thalesacademy.org and Matthew Ogle at matthew.ogle at thalesacademy.org in case anything, you know, you have any sort of questions that come up once the webinar is over. We'll also be record, we have recorded this webinar as well, and we'll be posting it on our Thales Press YouTube channel and our uh, Thales podcast, Developing Classical Thinkers. Oh, we did get one more question, speaking to the study of foreign and world languages within classical education. So we do spend, um, in, at, at Thales Academy, in our junior high program, we ask that students take Latin from sixth grade through seventh grade and into eighth grade. And then in our high school program, students um, have the option of taking Spanish or Latin. So they have the option to stick with Latin if they were with us in our middle school program, or to choose a new language um, and <clears throat> to choose a new language and take Spanish. As far as the, the manner in which um, a, cla a classical education incorporates the study of ancient languages, there are manifold reasons for that. Um, for one, it opens up the world of the Greeks and Romans to our students. You know, the past is a foreign country, but if you speak the language, you can navigate around uh, much easier than you could if you're relying on translations um, of, of popular primary sources and things like that. Anyone who has read the Aeneid in its original Latin or the Iliad in its original Greek can testify just how much uh, more power and weight the words of Homer and the words of Virgil have. Um, then in reading them in translation, no matter how good that translation is, there's always something that's missed um, from, the word, from the words of the original poet. Also, we stress uh, the teaching of Latin because we believe that it, it builds a certain level of problem solving skills and grit, as well as encouraging students to focus on very precise and minute details. So that studying a language like Latin um, really has the same sort of benefits to it as in studying math. You know, we uh, study math in order to, I mean, figure out problems, develop quick thinking skills and so on. And Latin has a lot of those same benefits as well. Um, so another one came in about, do we think a, um, we'll be adding any additional language options um, to our current curriculum? At this point, we, don't, we do not have any plans um, to offer anything outside of what we're currently offering in our course catalog, um, but I have learned to never say never. Um, so, you know, there is potential to um, expand upon that. Again, if we have the interest in enrollment, um, we would still want to fit within, you know, those classical guidelines. So it may be something um, you know, of a dream to offer Greek one day. Um, but at this current moment, we are not focusing in on, on adding any other languages. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to our talk on the fine arts and how we integrate them with practical skills here at Thales Academy. Well, for uh, in closing, I would love to encourage everyone to attend our next Thales Press webinar, which is going to be held on January 7th at 3 p.m. That webinar is entitled Mathematics, A Pedagogy of Wonder, and it's with Jonathan Gregg, who is a professor, assistant professor at Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. This webinar is going to show the relationship between mathematics and a classical education and how math taught classically helps students develop the same sorts of, of really rigorous dynamic problem solving skills, as well as a confidence that the world that we live in is not, it's not random, it's not chaotic even if it may seem that way, but mathematics showcases the beauty and harmony and order that's really in the world around us. So very excited for that webinar and our time with Jonathan Gregg, and I would highly encourage you to attend as well. We would love to see you there. With that, we can close the webinar, and I wish everybody a good night. Thank you all so much, and until next time, stay classy and stay classical. <laughs>